Internal debugging. This came up before we were talking about debugging things with Ollie debug and such, and people said, can you follow it into the kernel? And I said, no, you can't. Ollie debug can't get in the kernel, but live KD can. Now, there's two ways to do this. This is the old-fashioned way, which is the official supported by Microsoft way. And when I taught this class last time, there was a Microsoft engineer in the class. And he said, hey, there's a new, easier version of, of WinDebug. And there is. So we'll do that next time. WinDebug preview is the new um, sort of beta version of something that's supposed to be easier. As we're going to see, it's not much easier. <laughs> But anyway, this is the old-fashioned standard one we're going to do first. You have to install debugging tools for Windows from Microsoft. It's a free download, but it is specified for each version of Windows. So you go to the Windows Software Development Kit, and this will install all kinds of stuff, and you just uncheck everything except debugging tools because the rest of it gets really big and we're not using it. Then you have to set up kernel mode debugging. You have to do this with the bcd edit command. This will turn on debug. And you can see it here. If I clean up this old stuff... And I don't need this anymore. All right. I clean up all this old stuff. All right. If I open an administrator command prompt, if you're not uh, familiar with Windows system administration, you might not know about BCD edit. Uh, in Windows XP, it was called boot.ini. And ever since Vista, they use a binary configuration data to control the boot up settings of Windows. And if you type BCD edit, with no parameters in an administrator command prompt, it will show you the current settings of the boot up of your machine. And uh, two settings, this is boot manager, and, and so it shows you here, uh, the first one is not the one we're using, I'm not sure what that is. The second one is current, that's the one we're using. And come on, there we are, current. And you can see this line, debug, yes, because I've already executed these commands on this box. If you haven't executed them, you won't see that line. So we have to do this. This will turn on debugging and set debug settings to local. Remember, we talked about this in the lecture. The old-fashioned way of debugging the kernel is to have two machines connected by a cable. And you would still have to do that if you really wanted to have all the features, like putting breakpoints in the kernel. Because if you put a breakpoint in the kernel, your machine will stop. And then you can't use the mouse or the keyboard or anything, so how do you get anything done? You have to have it controlled to another machine that is controlling it. And so that's what, but this local means I'm not going to do it that way. So um, at least I think that's what it means. I'm not really sure. But anyway, it works. Then you have to adjust the path uh, because we're going to want to run this um, debugger. So you put this path in the path in advanced system tools. This is a Microsoft path variable. You need this path to get to the Windows 10 kits. And as usual, it's confusing as possible. It's in the x86 directory, but it's in the x64. So that's Microsoft for you. Um, anyway. Then you get Live KD, which is already installed on the machine I gave you. And if not, it's a free system kernels tool from Windows. Live KD is Microsinovich's brilliant tool that connects to the kernel. It lies to the debugger and tells it the kernel is a kernel dump file. So it works. So you can view the kernel on a running machine without a second machine. And so then you just run Live KD minus W. And there's a 32 and 60, there's a version that says 64 and a version that doesn't show 64. And for some reason, the one that works on here is the one that doesn't say 64, just to keep you good and confused. Anyway, live KD minus W is what works. And it, it runs the debugger. It, it, it connects the debugger to the live kernel, and it runs the debugger, and here it is. Now, this tool is very, very, very annoying to use. I do not know why Microsoft didn't just make a command line tool like GDB because the features of Windows just get in the way all the time and make it hard to understand what's going on as far as I can tell. Um, but anyway, this is the way it is. You, you cannot click on much of anything. You just have to enter commands down here. You have to learn the right command lines and enter them. So uh, I do not know why they bothered. Uh, by the way, as usual, I wonder for the video if I can make the um, font bigger, and maybe I can. Okay, good. That makes the font bigger, which I think will make it a lot easier for the video to be viewed. All right, so you put commands down here to do things. And so the first thing we're going to do is list modules with LM. This lists all the running modules on the machine. And there's a lot of them. 
of course, because these Windows machines launch something like uh, 75 or 100 processes in the background, and I've been doing other things here. Notice that this is where symbols are loaded for your modules, so if you actually have the symbols to have the full ability to reference things inside that module by name, then you'd have symbols, but by default only a couple of symbols are present. This is ntdil, which we'll talk about a lot in the future, and here's nt. nt is the kernel. The real thing, full name of it is ntoskernel.exe. It is an executable. It must be loaded in RAM every time your machine is running, and it's what we're going to explore here is nt. And since you refer to it all the time, they give it a um, shortcut name, nt. Here's the full name. That's NP kernel map. That's the symbols, but it's NTOS kernel is the full name. So that's all right. Now you can see memory. I can look in the in there with DB. DB will display binary, the kernel NT. And of course, the whole kernel is huge. By default, it only shows you the first 10 or 20 lines. So here's just showing a hexadecimal dump. Here's the hex value, and here's the alphabet. And this, you see, it just looks like every other executable. Every executable starts with MZ. It has a useless MS-DOS stub header. Then it has, which is what this is, part of the MS-DOS header. And then later, it's going to have the full NT header and all that jazz. It's an EXE, just like all the ones we've looked at. Okay, now you can search for symbols. For I can search with X for things called NT bang star. And what that will do is give me all the symbols in the kernel. And as you could imagine, there are a lot of them. It can take a minute or two for them to scroll by. Every label in the kernel, including every function and every other labeled thing, has gone by. So there's far too many of them. So it's better to do a more limited one. So let's do nd bang star create file. And if you remember the thing we did last time where we used the um, API monitor, to monitor the file creation process in Notepad. We caught a few of these. There's only a few routines that contain the string create file, about 10 or 15 of them. There's an IOP one, a PX, BI create, and a ZW create file. And somewhere in this mess, there's one called NT bang, NT create file. This is the one we're going to look at, but there's a lot of others. These are all various ways to create a file in Windows. So let's look at this one, NT create file. You can unassemble it with U, so that's NT to tell you where the module lives, bang, and then the name of the module, which is NT create file. All right, now it unassembles it, and by default, it only gives you the first few lines. So you see the usual kind of assembly code we've been talking about. It is 64 bits. You have RSP, relative to R stack pointer, stack pointer. It's uh, this 64 bit assembly. And so you can uh, unassemble it. Now, if you want to unassemble more of it, you put the length in here with an L, L20. Now it'll do 20 bytes in hexadecimal worth of it, I think. So there you go. And this is, in fact, the entire assembly code for NT create file, which is something you get used to. A lot of the functions are nothing more than stub functions that call another function. It just calls this one, IOP create file. So all this does is shuffle the parameters around a bit to emit this. So it's just a stub that feeds another function. And there's an underlying function that does the real work. And this is what we've talked about before. A lot of malware doesn't use the convenient function intended for normal use. It uses the underlying native function that's undocumented. And as you can see, it's not that hard to figure out how this works. Now, this might be something that's actually documented. But if it wasn't, we could figure out how it worked by just reading this code, which is not all that hard. That's why they cannot hide anything from you in Windows. You can see everything in the kernel. You can see every function. You can see every label. You can see all the code. So even if they don't document a function, you can figure out what they do. <laughs> and people do. And that's why the malware just calls these things directly. And most antivirus products only stop the obvious ways to do it. Like if you're writing your code in C++ and running it through a compiler, then you go through the expected normal functions. But you can bypass them going directly to these low-level functions that are more powerful and harder to use. All right, and so you can also look at objects like this one. You can DT to see the structure of an object, and it's NT bang, and we can see what drivers are. Driver, object. It's a C++ data structure, which is most everything in Windows, and there it is. It's got uh, a whole series of fields. See, here's counting the bytes. Two bytes for type, two bytes for size, I guess, six bytes for size, two bytes for the object, and so on. And then you see various things here. Um, and somewhere there's a driver name. 
which is they pointed to a Unicode string, and so on. So this is the data structure of, of drivers. And there's a driver start pointer, which shows you where it's going to load, when it's going to start, when you, when you uh, launch it in memory. So you may have noticed those commands are very far from obvious. Like it was not clear at all that putting a capital L followed by a number is how to see more lines of it. And it's not quite clear what DT is compared to DB and DA and all that jazz. So um, if you want to learn anything, you do dot HH. And this opens a Windows 3.1 chum file. This is the old help files left over from Windows 95, and in fact from Windows 3.1. And this is where all the truth about the debugger is. This is where you learn everything. There's the index with everything, and you search. So if, for example, we just use this command, dt driver object. If you want to know how it works, go to search and search for dt. Enter. And there it is, display type. Double click on that. And now you have display type, and now it will show you what the options are. And this is where you really learn how to do everything in this debugger. And you can do awesome things. You can write scripts. You can do everything you do in Ollie, but you have to do it all in the command line. You can say break here every time you dar, every time you hit this breakpoint, print out this location in memory, and then resume. So you just have a live monitor, like every file that's opened in Notepad and things like that. And so the, the experienced cool guys learn to get really good at NT debug and that's at WinDebug, and that's all they use. They laugh at, at childish toys like Ollie. Do everything WinDebug with the right commands, and you can really exactly control what's happening in your machine and see everything. But there's a steep learning curve, and here we're only covering like a few of the simplest commands. So there's a few flags to find. And like I say, next time, we'll try the newer, friendlier version of WinDebug, which is a little bit friendlier, but not much friendlier. <laughs> So anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to show you.